1991's Scanners 3, Scanner, whatever, Scanners 3, The Takeover, aka Scanner Force, review and thoughts. So, this was a movie that I thought was astonishingly terrible, but also entertaining to watch. This review will have a number of jokes, and I will get into several several serious topics. Now, if you are looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by later movies, because of that, it's not as much fun to watch today, and or it's different from, you know, the, the first movie, so it automatically is terrible. Whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. And that brings us... So, yes, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I start this video with a review where, if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger so you can mute and skip ahead and so you see me lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for earlier entries in this franchise. And assume that as soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers including discussing the ending. So, the... Let's see. So, yeah, the movie is rated R for horror, violence, and sensuality. And, yeah, this video... I, I will be discussing the rated R material. And that brings us to the right yes yeah, so i have watched this once and i just got done watching it before i hit record so yes the plot a young female scanner becomes corrupted and let's see. Yeah, uh, this features a, a drug, uh, Ephemeral 3, or EPH3 for short, pronounced F3. Too bad it wasn't F4 combined with Alt. And yeah, uh, someone is going to try to stop the this dangerous scanner. And yeah. Um, starting with the writing. So, yeah, like the second movie, this was written by B.J. Nelson, which, you know, the very appropriate name because his work sucks. And thankfully, this time it wasn't only written by him, which, based on, com yeah, it was definitely his fault that the second movie was so bad, because here he is joined by three other writers, and this is a much more entertaining movie. It's still pretty bad, and it's a complete mess. But at least it isn't so... Like, the second movie, it's just like, why am I watching a discount remake of the first one? Like, just... If you're gonna do a sequel, actually make... A different movie don't just make the same movie just without the like I'm I love the work of David Cronenberg I think he is one of the most intelligent and interesting directors working you know he used to work in horror I guess he doesn't so much anymore but during you know let's see I guess that certainly the 80s and Maybe also some of the 90... Uh, yeah, anyway, for a while, he was an incredibly interesting director working in horror. He's still interesting, it's just that his movies don't quite qualify as, as horror anymore. There's no, there's no need to... Like, if you're gonna make... Like, I get why, you know, the second Friday the 13th movie is, you know... There's not a huge difference between the first two movies. The second one is a lot more entertaining. The first one was, like, and they'll say it. The the director and writer are on the record as, you know, you can, you in, in documentaries, they will say, 
We weren't expecting it to be a big deal. We made it to keep the lights on. We didn't care. We didn't think we were making a good movie. And, you know, that that's part of why even Kevin Bacon delivers bad acting in that movie, which is just absurd, you know. And yes, I knew he was in it before I watched the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special. But yeah, the the I get why the second one is is so similar to the first because they really needed to make a much better movie. It's still not a good movie. None of the Friday the Thirteenth movies, you know, the one that comes the closest is Freddy vs. Jason. The the Freddy movies are substantially better. Anyway, I get why you wanted to make a sequel that was so similar there, but it's really not necessary with Scanners. Like the first one holds up. Anyway, B.J. Nelson also wrote Lone Wolf McQuaid, Orion's Key, and Dirt Merchant. And he hasn't... Yeah, he hasn't done anything since 1999's Dirt Merchant, which he also directed and produced. So I'm guessing that movie basically killed what career he had. Eh, he wrote an episode of Renegade. But yeah, uh... I don't really think, you know, based based on scanners too. Like I'm I I don't take any joy in someone like losing jobs or something, but yeah, I'm I'm not hugely surprised that his career didn't last much longer. Now, in addition to BJ Nelson, this was written by Julie Richard, David Preston and Renee Mallow. Now, Julie Richard other than this, the only other thing she apparently... Yeah, she wrote the story for a direct-to-video 1992 movie called Twin Sisters. Which, based on the... It kind of sounds like a Skinamax, but I don't know. And there, there are limits to how deep I'm going to go with my research on something this... Yeah, anyway, uh, David Preston has written, he has ten, 21 TV writing credits and five movie writing credits. And other than this one, it's Space Hunter, Adventures in the Forbidden Zone, Breaking All the Rules, The Vindicator, and Bonjour, Timothy. So, yeah, and he also helped write Twin Sister. The, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, David Preston and Julie Richard write together, I guess. And, yeah, um... Yeah, Re last writer is Rene Mallow, who has... Oh, wow, yeah, this is the only thing he's written. Uh, he He's mostly a producer. He has 22 movie producing credits, three for TV, two for video, one for documentary, and one for short. And he acted in two movies, apparently. This is the only thing he's ever written, and uh, yeah, I, I do not really blame anyone for looking at this movie and being like, I don't think I'm going to hire the writer for, for anything else. When you make a movie, it is a good thing to have a script and a screenwriter. It can be good to have more than one writer if they work together or the work complements each other. It's not necessarily a good idea to have more than two, and certainly four is pushing it. It is not good to have four of both, all veering in wildly different directions. The more, the messier. Like, this is... Like, I... This must have been several scripts combined. There's no way that anyone sat down and said, Okay, so, I have one idea for a movie here. Um... The lead is going to go from America to Thailand, and he's going to study Buddhism. There's going to be a, an evil scanner who gradually accrues power. There's a smidgen, like, trace amounts of feminism, even though it kind of contradicts other things in the movie. And someone making this really wanted, like, there are action scenes in this, like, I commend them for, for them being more varied, more interesting, you know, I've, I've, I feel like the first one did a good job, 
Uh, I don't know why the second one did such a bad job, considering that they had... They're already remaking the first movie, but yeah. Well, actually, it was probably a budget thing, but but yeah. Um, although, the, actually, I think the second one did have a bigger budget. Anyway. This has much more varied action than the second one, and certainly the action... Uh, it goes places that the first one didn't, so I appreciate that, but I, I really, it really does not fit with the rest of the, the, like, yeah, um, just, just, someone working on this wanted there to be martial arts in a Scanners movie, and I don't think it turned out to be a good movie, but I can at least appreciate, like, if you're going to make more than one Scanners movie, because the first one really is excellent. It really does not need any follow-up, any any additional... If you're going to make more than one, if you're going to make any sequels, you got to go somewhere interesting with it. The second one really didn't. This one really does. And like the second movie, this pretends that there was some problem with adult Scanners taking Ephemeral 1. In the first movie, the the problem with the drug was giving it to pregnant women because it makes their babies scanners. When you give it to an adult scanner, it means they can control their powers. It is like medication, not a harmful drug. And then the second, it's addictive. And here the newest version just plain turns you into a crazy person and really sadistic and evil. I really don't think both of these sequels had to do the war on drugs thing. And, yeah, after a 10-year wait for a sequel to the original movie, they released two in the same year, which, like, I am amazed that this was directed by the same guy and that one of the writers of this also wrote the second, because it really feels like it was completely different. Pe like, it's not a spoiler to say this has nothing to do with the second. It doesn't even have anything to do with the first really other than the ephemeral thing which you know both of these sequels contradict how ephemeral worked in the first movie so but but yeah you know the second one does have something of a link oh right yeah i am spoiling yeah the second movie the protagonist is the son of the protagonist the the yeah the two protagonists Wait, yeah, the protagonist and his love interest from the first movie, and uh, he also has a, a sister, it's introduced kind of late in the movie, so I don't know, yeah, anyway, uh, yeah, I think it was just they felt like, oh, we, we gotta have to, we have to have a male scanner and a female scanner, even if the, I'll, I'll grant, you know, the, uh, I want to say Kim Oberst was her name, it wasn't in the entirety of the first movie, but it didn't feel like just... It, it, in the second movie, it doesn't really feel like the female scanner needed to be there. She's there because they don't want to mess with the formula. You know, they were pretty sure that they just had to make the same movie in order to appeal to audiences of the first. And this is just like... Like, it feels... Yeah, it feels like the first one... Maybe this was always pitched as a two-movie deal, and they were like, okay, if the first movie, if the first sequel we make is the same as the original, the studio's gonna be like, okay, we're gonna make money off this, you know, just whatever, let them go nuts, no studio notes, absolutely no oversight, because, like, actually, that is one thing, I was gonna say, there's no way that the producers really paid attention to what they were doing on this movie, actually, it is an odd mix of multiple early 90s tropes. So you have this... Because this thing of, you know, white dude goes to an East Asian country to, you know, become at one with, you know... That was a thing. There, there was a thing of, of that around that time. It also has the, like, Skinamax thing going on. And I already mentioned the martial arts, which, you know, a lot of martial arts action movies around the the time. And the, the yeah, the slightly feminist, but not really. And, and 
of a woman as the villain and just, yeah, um, nothing wrong with female villains, mind you, but just the way that they would handle them around this time was not great. And, uh, yeah, plot twists, I can't really claim they were boring, so, so there's that. Um, it is one of those movies where, uh, one of the twists basically, like, um, I guess it's not really that the movie falls apart when you learn it, but it is the kind of twist that just, it makes you, it makes you really question some of the things in the other movies. Yeah, let's, let's, I, I think I will try to expand on that when I get into spoilers, but they are definitely spoilers for this movie in order to discuss. So, yeah, moving on to the direction. So this was directed by Christian Duguay. Oh, wait, was it? Crap. Uh, I'm gonna really, I forgot to, I looked up how you pronounce his last name, and then I forgot to put it into the or am I thinking, wow, maybe I'm just thinking of someone else. Um, hold on, maybe it's on. I'll just, re I'll real quick check IMDb, because I feel like I found his name, and it was pronounced in a different way than I thought. But since, there we go, so, uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. Christian, and there it is. Okay. Nope, does not say anything about his... Okay. Um, but he's like, let's see, he's he's French-Canadian. De Gay. I'm thinking it's De Gay. Christian De Gay. Based on my very limited knowledge of the French language. So, he has... 22 directing credits for TV on stuff like Medici, Anna Karenina, Under the Roman Sky, Augustine, The Decline of the Roman Empire, Beautiful Life, TBL. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a lot of historical stuff. I guess he's he's a history buff. He directed Human Trafficking, the 2005 TV miniseries. He, he's listed as directing four episodes. There are only four episodes. He directed the entire miniseries. I rank, rank it an 8 out of 10. I think he did a really solid job there. I think it's been... I haven't watched it since 2005. If I watched it today, I would probably call it very exploitative. Wow, I just combined both of the pronunciations into one. I guess that's what we're going with. But it it was a time when it was necessary to educate people. I, I don't think it was trying to just make money off of, uh, you know, because it's like human trafficking is a serious problem. I don't think it was just trying to, to make money off of a serious issue. I think you know, watching it, I really felt like, okay, this is, this was written and directed by people who really want to put a stop to human trafficking. He also directed both episodes of the 2003 Hitler, The Rise of Evil TV miniseries, and it's, it's fairly well directed from, from, no, yeah, yeah, it's, it's directed well. I, I have some issues with it. Those are mostly script based, but he, he does a good job. And like, I mean, it's not, it's not a, some great feat to get a really solid performance out of Robert Carlyle, but the performance by Robert Carlyle is really excellent. So yeah, I don't know, it's possible Christian DeGay just got out of his way, because he really is excellent in that and elsewhere. 
uh, let's see, the uh, 1999 Joan of Arc miniseries. Let me let me real quick see. He directed so he directed two episodes. I don't know if I'll, I'll look up real quick if that is all of them. Let's see. So ah, uh, hold on. Where is it? There it is. Okay, so oh yeah, the I've heard of it. Uh, the Lily Sobieski Joan of Arc. I have not watched it, but I could see she she's a. She's given good performances. She she did during the 90s and early 2000s, so I'd, I'd be interested in watching it. If I find, like, yeah, there are two episodes, so he directed all of that one. And, yeah. You know, Lily Sobieski makes sense as being cast in that, in my opinion. Let's see, um... Yeah, I gotta say, the m most of the rest of the stuff I don't really know, but yeah. So yeah, two, 22 TV directing credits, 12 feature movies, including one just last year called Ride Above. So his career is still going. And, uh, okay, I gotta, is that? He directed something called Bell and... Sebastian the Avenger. Oh, okay. It's a uh, it's a boy and his dog movie. Yeah, I I don't know. I I just I was wondering. Wait, Bell and is that like Beauty and the Beast two or something? That, but no. It's a it's a boy and his dog movie. And yes, he directed the two thousand eight movie Boot Camp, which I also did a video review of, and. I have a lot of respect for that movie because there's there's stuff in it that really shouldn't work, and he makes it work better than you think. Like it's a it's a very flashback heavy movie, and like some movies, if if there's a lot of flashbacks, it just kind of takes you out of it because it is this thing of like a flashback by definition cannot progress the plot. It can give you backstory, it can develop characters, it cannot further the plot. That is simply not something it is capable of doing. And it uh, he makes it work fairly decently. Yeah, on, honestly, my problems with that tend to be more with the script than the, the um, direction. Right, he directed The Art of War, which... I'm just gonna say, I feel like Wesley Snipes movie? Yeah, Wesley Snipes vehicle. And let's see, then he, yeah, he, he directed Screamers in 1995, which I would very much like to watch because it is an adaptation of a Philip K. Dick story. And Philip K. Dick, problematic though he was, is one of my favorite authors. And the screenplay was written by Dan O'Bannon, who also helped write Alien. So just yeah, I would I would very much like to to watch. Yeah, um, I know it's probably not going to be like amazing because honestly, there's like I think the only truly good adaptation of a Philip K. Well, actually, to be fair, there are a couple. Um, the Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, um, Peter Verhoeven, Paul Verhoeven. Okay. Ah, uh, crap. I forgot the name of... But I will find it shortly. Total Recall. Blade Runner and a Scanner Darkly. And Minority Report. Of all of the adaptations of Philip K. Dick novels... That is definitely one that exists. He also directed the 1992 live... I've done a video talking about what I dislike about that movie. Anyway, the 1992 Live Wire was also directed by him. And that's another movie where, like, I can't really fault the direction. Like, there are times where the direction get kind of ridiculous. But, like, it must have been in the script. Because it's not really like him. I don't know. I guess it's possible that, you know... 
when you know that early in his career his career started with these two movies in 1990 oh hold on no never mind uh his f feature directing career started with these two sequels so you know early in his career maybe he was taking weird chances but i could imagine it was just in the script because when he doesn't have like there are several of his movies that never get weird like the the let's see so yeah both of his scanner movies although yeah the first the scanners 2 doesn't get that weird really it's it doesn't go very many new places from the the first scanners movie anyway live wire gets kind of weird but you know boot camp doesn't hitler the rise of evil human trafficking yeah i i figure it's a, a screenplay thing so Worst to best that I've seen him direct, other than this one, Scanners 2, 5 out of 10, Livewire, 6 out of 10, Boot Camp, 6 out of 10, Hitler, The Rise of Evil, 8 out of 10, and Human Trafficking, 8 out of 10. And yeah, this was shot back to back with the second movie with some of the same cast and crew. So the, yeah, the, the, um, okay, yeah, not 100% back to back. The, the second one is listed as being shot during yeah, at, at least on the 22nd of November 1989, whereas this one was shot between the 24th of October 1990 and the 21st of December, December. But both of them were released in 1991. You know, so, yeah. So, yeah, in my experience, he's only as good as his script. Good script, good movie. Bad script, bad movie. And, yeah, it's just, it's it's really... It must. It it was probably fun writing this. I I will grant that, and and directing it. It looks like he had fun directing it, and the the some of the main some some of the major cast also definitely had fun. And uh, let's see. I wanted to make sure that I wrote. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> so, critic quotes. All bets are off. It's not even trying to make sense with the first two movies. The powers aren't consistent with those. The plot is workable and Christian Gay still has style, but the problem I have is the tone of the film. Here our director decides to go in a more cartoony direction, and the result is far less serious than its predecessors, with many of the franchise's iconic scenes, like the obligatory head explosion scene, resulting more in unintentional laughter than shock. Was he trying something different for the franchise, or was this new tone the result of everyone involved not giving two shits as they were drunk off the surprise success of part two? The whole product has an aura of cheap action flick as supposed, as opposed to a cerebral piece of science fiction. In other words, it's just lame. As the sequel goes, this is the Robocop 3 of the franchise. One watches it hoping for even a light glimpse of the fire that burned so brightly in the entries before but are disappointed to see the flames snuffed out. Scanners 3 just lacks balls, and the cartoony approach kills anything this sequel had going for it, which is a damn shame as the filmmakers were successful with the last entry. So, I agree that it's cartoony. It appears to me to be the, the screenplay. I, I really don't think that he would just go completely bonkers when, when he... Yeah, anyway, I could be wrong, but it's definitely cartoonish, and, and the direction is part of it. I just think that started with the script. It seemed to have been a curse of good 80s films with exploitable theme to sink even lower depth, cheaper effects on amateurish actors, the more Roman numerals one would attach to them. Remember Robocop? Half-decent sequel, a third part that reeked. Warlock? Cult classic first part, mediocre second, unwatchable third. Wow. I forgot there was a third one. I don't think I've even watched that one. Yeah, the, the second one is, is fine. Highlander, American Ninja, Batman, the list could go on. And, yeah, it, it, like, it is a cartoon. Like, I was half expecting a character in this to, like, trick a vet out of the money raised to save the life of his service dog. 
to, you know, I don't know, run for office, I guess. We still don't know where that money went for sure, do we? Now, let's see. So, yes, the, the, um, the opening of the movie... Like, you, you realize right away that this is just not going to be a, a serious movie. I don't think I want to describe the opening before I get into the thought sections. I just want to briefly note that in the opening, apparently, there people aren't sure... If scanners exist, like, it's, it's, a, it's kind of treated like an urban legend. Like, some people believe it, and others are like, I bet you still believe in Santa Claus. And I just, like, the opening crawl says that this is connected to the first two. Because it, it references the events of the first one and sets up this thing of, of the, the drug. And then, like... I'm I'm just if the first movie the, the second movie had this same issue where like some people apparently don't believe and I'm just like how could the, f the events of the first movie be hidden like what did they say happened with all of these like the first movie leaves multiple people alive that would almost definitely like even if you want to say, okay, you know, maybe the company tried to cover it up. Even though, like, weren't most of the people in charge of the company dead by the end of the first movie? It's been, it's been a little... I, I haven't watched the first one since when I did the video on it. Uh, I don't know, a couple of months ago, maybe by now. I feel like I recall that, that basically everyone who had a lot of power at the, the company was dead by the end of it. And I don't think that Cameron would really, Cameron Vale, the protagonist of the first movie, would be that interested in covering it up. Like, I honestly, like, if, if you ignore these two sequels, I kind of figured that he would make sure that everyone that, like, they had a list of all the women that had been given ephemeral one during their pregnancy they knew who all the scanners were why not just make sure that all of them had access to ephemeral f1 information and they should all get information on f1 and that would kind of just solve it you know because in the first one if you don't get f1 you might be like unhoused you know you 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 have there are there are issues that that prevent you from living a normal life, and then like, yeah, it just it seems like it seems to me like after the events of the first movie, it would just be that okay now everybody knows that there are some people who have this thing and I don't know maybe their offspring would also have it certainly that's what the second movie says. Maybe not, uh, you know, maybe there's only one generation of scanners, but if there's more than one generation, it's still just, a, you know, if there's one thing we can say about, you know, ah, the, the, um, ah, crap, what's it called? Uh, the, the, um, the medical industry of America, they sure do love mass producing and just throwing as many pills at you as, you know, as, as long as they're making a profit, which I feel like, you know, couldn't Cameron, like, mind control someone into paying so that, you know, or passing a law or something, you know, passing some regulation that makes sure that they always get F1, but, you know, but, yeah, both of these movies are basically acting like the first movie left things unresolved for them to, to play around with, but, but, yeah, um, somehow... The, the the events of the first movie are not just public record. So I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but certainly by and large it fits with what came before. 
I think the ending is fun. Not good, but fun. I think an argument could be made of... Let's see... Yeah, the... the um, I think an argument could be made that there's Deus Ex Machina. And... I don't... I, if, I saw someone else point out, you know, maybe they just ran out of money. This is one of the only movies I know that has no music playing over the end credits. Like, I, I you know, it, it started to go to credits, and then I, like, looked away from the screen for, a, like, a second or two, and there was no audio, and I was like, wait, did that... Was the, is there, like, a, a, a scratch on the disc or something, and it just, you know, stopped playing? And I looked back, no, 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 the, the titles are, are running, but there's just no music at all like and it's not even like a thing like it's um if you wanted to make like a thing out of it you'd maybe like have a faint sound of wind or crickets or something yeah crickets would definitely fit the tone but no there's just nothing i mean you can't accidentally release something and just forget to put music over the end credits i don't think i've never heard of that being a thing so yeah. Um, and, and yeah, the end credits, uh, unsurprisingly, not particularly... You know, the information in there you can find on IMDb as well. And it's just bland white text on a black screen scrolling. There's there's nothing particular. Yeah. Which, you know, it's not like... It's not a big deal, but the one... You know, the first movie did have interesting credits. And that was a movie that they had to really rush through making... You know, how wild is it that the one Scanners movie of the trilogy that isn't, like, that, that doesn't have, like, a lot of really bad, awkward writing is the first one where they reportedly didn't have a complete script before. Like, David Cronenberg would write a scene, write lines of dialogue in the morning, then they would go out and find a location, and then they would film it. So the actors had almost no time to learn their lines and get, you know, which is, which helps explain the the performance that, I forget his name, but the, the actor playing Cameron Vale. It's, although I still, you know, it, it, I warmed up to it, ultimately. So, yeah, this is one of those sequels where it doesn't really understand the first one, but it does try to... I mean, certainly the, the you know... If this movie could talk, and you asked it what, what was good about Scanners 1, what it would say was the scanner powers, because that is the thing. Like, there's no, you know, like the critic I quoted, this is not cerebral, this is just, this is... If if this... If I, if I saw maybe, like, 20 minutes of this and then didn't get to watch more, I would probably have guessed that it was a Saturday morning live-action cartoon instead of a movie, because it really just... Yeah. So... Liliana Kamarowska plays Helena Monet. I think it's supposed to be pronounced Monet, but a lot of people in this movie pronounce it Monet, as in, like, slang for money. So, yeah, I mean, she's, like, her family is rich, so I guess that's, yeah. On this character, I do have thoughts. I will get into them in the thoughts section, the... Second and final one since spoilers. Probably also some in, in the first thought section, but yeah. According to IMDb Trivia, Liliana Kamarowski is the wife of the film's director, Christian Duguay. So it's another case of look at my hot wife, as DSD can point out about, you know, movies like Under... the Yeah, several of the Underworld movies... And, you know, Paul W. Anderson's movies that have Mila Jovovich in them. So, let's see. Yeah, yeah. Um, some critic quotes on her. 
Liliana Komarovsky is brilliant as Helena. She's sweet and nice at first, but when she starts taking F3, she becomes damn near demonic, and that's awesome. She's mean, she's awful, she has no problem killing people to get her way because, god damn it, she wants more from life. Polish actress Liliana Komarowska, who plays Helena, chews so much scenery, I'm surprised there are any set sets left to act on. Every other line, she says, is an awful groan-inducing one-liner. It's like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Batman Robin all over again. There's clearly an attempt to incorporate some ironic dark humor, like Paul Verhoeven's Robocop did, but it mostly falls flat. She she is just fascinating to watch because I I don't know if she is actually just a bad actress. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time that you know someone who isn't that good of an actor gets a you know a major role without like you know I I don't like harping on you know. It's, it's ridiculous how, like, women will get a lot of shit for, you know, if, if they give a bad acting performance, but there are so many movies where men give terrible performances, and that's just kind of, uh, you know, whatever. You know, once, yeah, Arnold Schwarzenegger... Actors like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone, I wish that they only did the movies. That I, I wish that they had the self-awareness and clout to turn down any role that they do bad on. Because imagine the image that they would have if the only thing they ever played. If Schwarzenegger only ever played the Terminator and honestly he does a pretty decent job in the first Predator I feel like there's at least one more, maybe also Commando, you know, it's cheesy, but it fits. But no, you know, you also have Batman and Robin, and, you know, the various comedies he did. And Stallone, if the only thing we knew of Sylvester Stallone was Rambo and Rocky, like, instead of, you know, Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, or... <sighs> Too many to name. Just, yeah. You know, they, they have talent. Anyway, yeah. You know, the, the 90s were... Action movies in the 90s were dominated by white guys with... You know... There's nothing wrong with having a European accent, but the fact that they had European accents did make them less convincing because they were very frequently cast as just plain Americans, and they they weren't particularly good at acting. They were good at, at the, you know, Schwarzenegger had the big muscles. Um, you know, I've always had a bit of soft spot for Van Damme. He had the, the fighting, the kicks and such, you know. But they were, they tended to give back. That's another, you know, when, when he's acting without speaking he can actually do a good job like if you watch like i'm not saying the replicant is a good movie but honestly he's he's surprisingly good like he's you know he plays more than one role in that but one of them he doesn't say a huge amount and it is this sort of just yeah when you know when it's just a look that's another, you know, Universal Soldier. A lot of the time in that, he he isn't really saying anything, and it's just his face acting, and he's, you know, he's basically playing this sort of innocent kind of, you know, and he does a really good job. He has very good comedic timing when that's required. Anyway, so I'm not saying that it's, you know, oh, women just don't know how to act. There are tons of excellent female actresses. You know, and, and thankfully, today they're finally getting more respect. You know, women like Anya Taylor-Joy, Margot Robbie. I know that Jennifer Lawrence, she'll sometimes accidentally say something that will get people really upset. But when you, you know, if you look at her acting, she's incredibly talented. And, you know, people blew it way out of proportion when she recently said... You know, that she thought that she was the first 
female action lead, uh, you know, and, and a lot of conservatives used that, you know, she probably just misspoke, used that as a way to avoid talking about the issue she actually raises, that there are way too few women in action movies, in, in the lead in action movies. Anyway, yeah, she, um... Kara Kamarowska is incredibly entertaining to watch, and I don't, I, I don't know her from anything else. I have no idea if she is, like, otherwise, let's see, oh, wow, she, yeah, she's been in 63 things, including something from just last year, so, yeah, there's some chance that she just is, oh, she was in, in Hitler, The Rise of Evil as well. The Baroness. Ah, gotta say, I do not recall. Oh, wow. He's put her in a bunch of his stuff, actually. Um, yeah, a bunch of the things he's directed, he put her in. But, yeah. Um, I, I would... I'd be willing to watch something else of hers if I heard someone say that she actually does good acting in that because it really is just like it feels like a choice here also because like early on like there's a very clear distinction between the the evil her and then the way that she is before she starts taking f3 and and it really is yeah maybe that's why there's no you know why there isn't more than one of this movie for the for the for Scanners 4, they kept trying to hit the F4 button, but they also hit the Alt key, so they never got to write the script. Anyway, yeah, um, there's a very clear distinction be between the two. I wouldn't necessarily say that she delivers a particularly good performance as, as either, but you can tell that she's not just, like... Yeah, and, and look, I defy anyone to do a good job with these lines. Like, I feel like that's, you know, dialogue, like, these one-liners, you either have to just go over the top and, and you know, play it to the back row, or you have to just, like, it's, it's impossible to make, it's impossible for us to take it seriously, no matter how you perform it. So you're either going to do it kind of boring, or you're going to have fun with it, and then we have fun. And Valerie Valois plays Joyce Stone. And I kept feeling like there was going to be more to the character than there is, but ultimately she is basically just the love interest for Steve Parrish's character, Alex Monet. And, uh, yeah, critic quotes about him. The main cast is great. Steve Parrish, who actually gets third billing in the opening and ending credits, is a fine, conflicted hero as Alex. He sells the whole needing to go to Thailand to deal with his personal issues thing, which could have been ridiculous with a lesser actor. Parrish also sells the manipulating people with his mind thing, which is all what all good scanner actors need to do. I do wish he engaged in some martial arts stuff, as that would have made his Thailand excursion so much cooler. Parrish has only done a few things in his career. His IMDb says that he took some time off from his acting career to raise his son, which is commendable. But he seems like he's trying to get back into the acting game. I'd like to see more from him. As with Scanners 2, the level of acting in this film is pretty poor, but somehow it seems to fit the lighter tone and not be as painful as if the cast were totally playing it totally straight. Liliana Komarowska is pretty terrible as Helena Monet, spending most of the film pulling faces and laughing whilst her acting ch accent changes more often than her hairstyle. However, Steve Parrish fares a little better as her tormented brother Alex, and whilst he spends most of the film looking glum and sorry for himself, he does have some of the heroic presence. Okay, this, this, that, that was lacking in the two previous films. See, I think it's part of the first movie that... Yeah, there's not really, like, is Cameron really the hero? Because he's basically just, like, you know, he's lived most of his life unhoused and, you know, with this, like, you know, before he knew he was a scanner, he, all he knew was other people's voices are in his head all the time. So that's, you know, he can't really 
he doesn't really fit into normal society. And then this guy comes along and gives him a drug that makes him feel okay again. And he's basically like a corporate spy. Like, uh, or yeah, a spy working for a corporation. Not, not like, or arguably going to other corporate, but, but yeah. You know, he, I, I'm not sure I would say that he's really a hero. He's just, he accepts that he's been given a mission because the guy, you know, like he's the the Dr. Ruth in the first movie is basically using manipulation. He's he's healing a guy in return for the guy doing something for him, which is just like incredibly unethical. You know, I think it is key to the first movie. I I don't think that David Cronenberg is a director who's particularly interested in giving the audience a hero character. I think he wants us to question if the protagonist is doing good or bad. And uh, honestly, in the second, you know what? It Yeah, I guess it's been, has it been a month maybe? I barely even remember the hero from the second one, uh, which I only watched once. Uh, the first one I've watched multiple times. Yeah. He really did not make much of an impression. Like, I remember that he's the son of Cameron, but that's basically... Yeah, yeah, I have, there's some chance that that one was missing a heroic presence. And in this one, yeah, this, this is pretty unambiguously. He's supposed to be the hero. He's the, you know... I think a strong case could be made that the movie would probably be over much sooner if he never went to Thailand. And, you know, you get why he went there, but it kind of seems like they basically they had to get him a bit out of the way so that, yeah, it's a little while. Before, because once he comes back, like, he's fairly effective in this. He's he It doesn't take him a huge amount of time to, to get to the bottom of what's going on and, and start fighting back. So, yeah. As for the rest of the cast, there's nobody else that adds anything of any merit, and despite the confused nature of what should be a relatively straightforward plot, there is the feeling that nobody on screen really knows what's going on. Yeah, because it really, like, the plot itself seems incredibly straightforward. You can tell he's a Buddhist not just because he's in a Zen monastery surrounded by robed masters, but mostly because he carries around a tech book on Buddhism. There's actually, there's this scene where, where, you know, he's walking around with the textbook on Buddhism and, and his master approaches him. And I was half expecting the guy to be like, please stop carrying around that textbook. The audience get it. You're in Thailand. You're, you know, there's a monastery right there. We saw you sit in the monastery before. You're surrounded by robes and masters. We get it. Buddhism. Parrish can't touch her vampy appeal, but he's a serviceable enough hero and knows how to throw a cranial right cross with the best of them. So, early in this movie, he is using the scanning ability to entertain people at a party. So, for those following along, playing the home game, in the first movie, being a scanner is a state that completely changes what your life is like compared to non-scanners. It's comparable to a mental health diagnosis. In the second one, you'll be fine if you grow up on a farm, but you will have problems, not when you get to the city, but when the plot requires you to. And now in the third film, it is a trick for parties, like close-up magic. And, yeah legitimately he's he's he does a decent job with the the with the material he's given colin fox plays their adoptive father elton monet and yeah um for a lot of it his performance is actually decent uh but there's there's just a couple of times where it's like what are you doing what was that Daniel Pilon, R.I.P. as Michael. Right, the yeah, he's like the the lawyer. So he's basically like he's the friend of their adoptive father Elton, and he's also the family lawyer. I I mean I think it's basically because yeah yeah because the plot needs him to have a relationship with the family. 
you know, yeah, relationship with the family, lawyer, and being like the the connection. Yeah, he he connects multiple plot strands that would otherwise be more. Yeah, that's like there's actually some decent writing in this. Like, it's it's kind of silly that there is this like. I mean, okay, I guess they're both. Well, yeah, because because Elton is like working at he's he's a pharmaceutical like. Oh, actually, yeah, yeah, he's he's like the CEO of the company, so he yeah he needs a lawyer close by, and he figured that once he dies, that lawyer will have to deal with his two adoptive children so they are okay yeah that's that's fair that actually does make a decent amount of sense and yeah the writing like it it accomplishes like instead of having to have because if 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 there was a lawyer character and then a separate character that was a friend of the family because he actually goes to thailand to find alex when something major happens to, to bring him into where where the the father is not able to to go and that means that he can you know he doesn't have to introduce himself to Alex and and gain his trust or whatever they know each other they they knew each other before he went to Thailand so yeah it's 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 baffling how at times the script can actually be economical and then at other times it's just throwing everything at the wall. Now, Peter Wright plays Mark Dragon, who obviously took his character's last name as as a bit less of a last name and more of a stage direction kind of he is overacting hugely like Ka Kamarowska and the scenes they share are just hilarious like it really feels like they're trying to outact one another and neither of them are quite willing to accept the other one coming out on top there there's one part where she like you know at the end of of you know yeah he he does a really ridiculous over the top thing and then she comes in and tries to get the zinger and and really just yeah it's 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 incredibly funny to watch very very entertaining and sith sekai plays a monk and i i appreciate yeah they actually they didn't feel you know they they didn't try to pass off a white guy as no they actually did hire someone from i i don't know if they're i, I guess i could very quickly look up if he actually is from thailand it does not say and it's the only thing he was in but yeah um they actually did find someone who looks like he belongs there so that's appreciated and Harry Hill, R.I.P., plays Dr. Bauman, and he's also, like, at first, like, actually, yeah, I feel like Kamarowska is not in every single scene, but she shares a lot of scenes with other over-actors, and maybe part of it is the, the thing with the, um, you know, if you're cast as a scanner, it's, you know, the, the, the director basically has to rein you in from from going like really over the top or at least you know to make sure you're only going over the top when that makes sense yeah uh when she isn't in a scene sometimes someone else will take over and and do the the ridiculous over the top acting I suppose I won't say whether he is whether he shares a scene with her or I'm just gonna let you know there's at least one scene of him and like at first I thought okay not everybody in this is gonna ridiculously overact I, I guess it's not only 
the the it's not only Steve Parrish not overacting, but no, Bauman revealed you know he is also ridiculously over like there's this bit where he's like basically going tut tut tut, and I swear his finger he shakes his finger like it's on fire and he thinks that shaking it vigorously like he, he can't just blow on it or put it in in liquid or something no he he has to shake it until eventually the fire just yeah it's it's yeah claire Cellucci, r.i.p played susie michael coman played mitch chip chipka played thomas Jean Frenet, Max, Simeon Beauchamp, Rufus, Gaston Perrault, Benny, Michael Perrault, Charles. Yeah, a lot of these must be. Based on the name, sounds like they are French Canadian. Tony Roman, RIP, as the piano player. Christopher B. McCabe as George. And Rene Mello as Robert Rosenthal. And I gotta say, most of the. I, I do not really. I, I can't put face, faces to those characters because I. Like, there's a lot of memorable uh, actors and performances in this, but I did not really catch their names. I, I think for a lot of them, they didn't give them. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, um... Not really getting anything out of looking at their headshots on IMDb either. But, yeah, uh, most of the, the scanners, like, there's there's... There's one that's very prominent, and he really, like, he chews scenery like there's no tomorrow. He really sells this crazed scanner thing. And let's see. Yeah, um, quoting a fellow critic here, I could have done without Kamarovska's inexplicably goofy gang of fellow scanner henchmen and Claire Cellucci's busty henchwoman, throwing hitch kicks and unfunny witticisms, complete with accompanying cuckoo sound effects, with abandon, but they don't consume enough screen time to sink the ship. I I thought they were so much fun that, uh, honestly, I've, uh, yeah, the the second movie really should have had... The second movie does have the one guy, the, the one, like, henchman, right-hand man scanner. He can be fairly fun. But this one has more really fun... Like, I don't know. I guess I was also just ready for them to not be particularly, like... When I watched the second one, it was like, it's such a, such a step down from the first one, you know. But then with this, like, it's just so goofy, like, I honestly, you, you, you'll do best to just forget that it has anything to do with the David Cronenberg. Otherwise, it's just going to be like, oh, I can't believe this. But if you do manage to, to yeah, I, I did not really think about David Cronenberg during, uh, watching this, thankfully. And, yeah, it's just... It's it's very it's it's entertaining, but for sure, like if you don't want this these goofy overacting, you're gonna hate this movie. And I guess that brings us to let's see. And, yeah, the MDB quote section only has two entries, and both of them are bad. So the cinematography was, oh, actually, i got to make sure to, there we go. Uh, okay, Hugh de Heck, who has... 13 TV credits as cinematographer and nine movie credits. And yeah, I am not familiar with anything else that he has made, but he continued working after this, so it didn't like destroy his career or anything. The the um the cinematography, I really wish that there were fewer parts 
where the camera I get it I get why but they'll like put the camera you know they'll have Alex and maybe someone else in frame and the camera will just spin around him I get that it's because he's like it's it's almost like a panic attack it's it's overwhelming and I'm not saying that like the second one also did some really stupid ridiculous camera moves for for those but yeah, I I really wish the that they had toned that down. But yeah, uh, by and large, it's just it's serviceable. I I'm not sure I really noticed much that stood out as especially like you know if you want like uh, early '90s kind of you know over the top you know feels like it could be a comic book kind of thing that has really great cinematography i recommend dark man the the first one definitely not the 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 second and third have much lesser cinematography and you know it helps that it is the um i forget his name but it's the guy who also did the matrix and team america um yeah i th no, it's... Okay, and the editing was handled by Yves Langlois, who edited 54 movies and 40 TV credits, four shorts, two documentaries, two video, and... Yeah. I don't think I'm really familiar with... Any of the other... Yeah, he, he edited both this and the second one. And Screamers... So, so yeah, the, the, um... He worked with... Uh, du Christian Duguay multiple times. So... Yeah, um... He edited one of the Highlander sequels, but... Someone had to. I don't, I don't hold that against him. Yeah. This one, there's definitely some editing choices that I thought really worked. Um, yeah. I, again, I'd say it's, it's serviceable. It's not something that you'd necessarily think of as, like, outstanding, which, you know, ultimately was possible with this kind of thing. The budget is estimated to be 5.4 million Canadian dollars. So that's more... It's definitely more than the first. I think it's also more than the second. So, yeah. And it was... It was apparently... Some of it was filmed in Thailand and... Otherwise, it was filmed in Montreal, which, yeah, it, it, this feels like it's it's Montreal doubling for an American city. So that's, yeah. And, yeah, that brings us to the action. So I'll start with a couple of critic quotes. The scenes in Thailand were apparently actually filmed in Thailand, which is always a worthwhile action movie location. Would have been cool if Alex engaged in some actual martial arts fighting while doing the scanning thing, but that doesn't happen. I would like to know why the Buddhist monks that train Alex to calm his mind and all that didn't also teach him martial arts as part of that calming plan. Maybe the production didn't have enough time to get Steve Parrish in fighting shape. At least the actual Thailand locals kick ass as real deal martial arts Artists and stuntmen. And let's see. Yeah, you might wonder, why does the movie have martial arts? Isn't scanning exciting enough? You know, to be fair, the original had shotguns and, like, car stuff. This has more varied action than the first two. And, yeah, I mean, I wish that the plot was more unique. I, I feel like that would have made this movie substantially more interesting. Like, if you just want action, there are much better, like, early 90s action movies than this. But, and and certainly, you know, there's not... Like, if, if you just want a, an early 90s martial arts action movie, you know, yeah, go for, go for something Van Damme. 
there's there's not as much martial arts in this movie as there are in in his so so yeah um yeah i, I think not all of his some of them have less than than others but yeah um there's a, a vehicle chase there are you know yeah the, the first one had shotguns this one has you know various guns and the the yeah the um the scanning scenes themselves like in the second one it kind of feels like the special effects team are showing off in this one there's less of that but there are still yeah there there aren't as many silly uses of the scanning powers but there are still a few and like if you just want some really impressive like scanning special effects i would go with the second one over this one uh, overall yeah maybe they just kind of felt like well we already did that let's go some let's go in a different direction this time there is some but it's not as impressive and there isn't as much of it so the score was composed by marty simon and let's see he composed for 15 movies he has 13 tv credits one short and yeah that's right he he composed for both of these sequels Right, I I haven't mentioned yet in this video, I have not been able to get my hands on copies of the Scanner Cop movies, and I haven't watched them before, so right now does not look like I will be doing videos on those. I, yeah, I don't have access to them, so plain and simple. But yeah, the the music is fine, and... um. Yeah, like, for sure, some of the time it, it does work well. Like, there are, you know... Yeah, some of the music really adds to the, the mood. So the sound design is pretty... <sighs> During the fight scenes... They add these really chop socky, ridiculous t t sounds. The scanning will sometimes have kind of overdone audio, but it's not as like like if you if you rewatch the first movie, the sound design on the scanning, on the voice, the the overlapping voices, and the way that it just you know basically. The, the sound design and acting have to sell it because scanning isn't real. It, the movie has to compel, con convey to the audience that this is just, it's, it's unbearable to, to have all this, you know, all these voices and the way that it just really, it, it hurts. And if you don't have the sound design, you know, what you are left with is a guy that's like... <sighs> you know it's 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 hard to do subtle you know so the sound design is doing a lot of heavy lif heavy lifting it's it's really excellent in the first movie and it's just incredibly underwhelming comparatively in both of these sequels so um let's see pacing i would say that it does actually Con considering that it is like i mean if if anything it's probably in a little too much of a rush because it has so many like the movie has to get alex to leave america go to thailand stuff happen in america that he's then told about in thailand then there's action scenes in thailand then he goes back to america and like all the while um his his sister is, you know, Helena is going around doing things in America and accomplishing a lot. Because there's there's a decent amount of legwork that goes into like, you know, at the end of the like the first movie, it's basically we're watching the war in in action. You know, the 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 legwork has been done. 
we're just we're watching Cameron you know be chased and and uncover the mystery and then the second one it's just well you know yeah there's there's legwork but it's it's so obvious and boring and it's just like and it's it's way too similar to the first one in the first one it was it was fresh and then in this like there's yeah there's a lot of like there are scenes that have to accomplish like have to have to get a lot accomplished for the the and yeah you know some of them are very very short because they they have to get all this out of the way and yeah it is it is fascinating like i i i would be interested in reading like an early draft of this and I, I wonder if someone just like realized well i mean we got to get a lot we got to get alex out of america if he's in america why is the movie as long as it like we have to get, you know because by the time he's back in america you know the the yeah i don't i'm not gonna say exactly how much of the movie he is in thailand but he does eventually come back to america and if he had been in america the whole time stuff that happens certainly it would they would have to completely rewrite it and that's yeah i have to wonder if they like figured we have to get him out of the country we have to somehow get because at the end of the day like if not for that i would basically say it would be it would be fine to just have him in america the whole time it's the it's the only of the three where the main you know where the protagonist leaves the country and he's gone for like two years not not of you know the i, I could make a joke about oh the movie feels like it it's it takes two whole years to watch. No, the movie moves along fairly nicely, you know. Obviously, I'm I'm sure it feels agonizingly slow if you hate the goofy tone. You know, if you if you I would yeah, I would say probably give it like the first thirty minutes or so. If by then the goofy tone bothers you Go ahead and turn off the movie. It is not going to get better. It is going to get substantially worse. And you're probably... Like, either eventually it's just going to click in place and you're going to be like, this is fun, this is entertaining. Or you're going to be miserable. Now, the movie is an hour and 33 and a half minutes long without end credits and 35 and a half long with them. And... Let's see. And, and yeah, like, I've it is... Like, I can't really claim, you know, if the movie was shorter, like, obviously, you know, part of the reason it's that length is that that is the bare minimum. You know, it's it's harder to get a movie in into theaters or on the, like, I'm still not, did this really go to theaters? It doesn't feel like a theater. Anyway, um... You know, feature length is considered to start at 90. If, if your movie is less than 90 minutes, you know, you might run into more trouble. Especially if, like, I think the shortest I've seen was uh, was in the 80s, kind of. I think if, if your movie is less than 80 minutes, then it really struggles. And that's why some movies will actually have extremely slow ending credits because they couldn't produce more of a movie anyway um let's see yeah i can't really claim that the movie should be shorter because something's always happening um it it does a better job of keeping things you know the first movie is still by far the best paced and each scene like every time cameron meets a new you know, whether it's one scanner or a group of scanners, there's something new to it. You know, he meets the artist who isolates himself and makes art to deal with the scanning. He meets this support group who scan together to to get, like, you know, these are really interesting ideas. And these sequels have nothing like that. The second one, he's just going, you know, it. he might as well be a cop. You know, he's just going place to place. He gets people to confess and, you know, finds 
yeah, finds criminals, stops crime. But then in this, like, there's so much, and honestly, a lot of it, I really didn't, I didn't expect. Like, I, I knew where it was going overall, but there were still steps along the way that I did not see coming, and just, yeah. The best element is that if, if you can, if you can match the frequency, if you can, if you are okay with how goofy and Saturday morning cartoonish it is, it is legitimately a fun experience to watch. But that is also the worst aspect, really. Um, this is, like, it's, it's, I don't know for sure. It is possible that people have convinced Cronenberg, just don't watch it. You know, it's not good. You're not going to get anything good out of watching it. And so he hasn't. You know, I, f I forget, who was it that people, like, talked out of watching sequels to a movie they made because they were so sure that they would just be upset? By I, f I forget, but there was... I, f I remember reading about someone, like, not watching the sequels to the movie they made because people told them no you're just you're gonna it's gonna make you sad but yeah i i was it was it ridley scott with some of the alien sequels maybe yeah I, I forget anyway if you if you know please let me know down in the comments anyway david cronenberg sometimes has a goofy sense of humor there's this shot in the, you know, they were they were testing for when they were making the fly. It was necessary to make it so that a character could walk on the ceiling. So they, they made this rig that allowed for that. And instead of asking someone else to go, Cronenberg went himself. And he put on this, like, basically... Yeah, like, like, a, like a Halloween costume of a fly... And there's, like, behind-the-scenes footage of him, you know, walking upside down. And, you know, after... Yeah, you know. So he, he takes a few steps. And you know how flies have those, like, an antenna, I guess it is? He, like, rubs his antenna and everybody, like, cracks up. And is like, nobody made him do that. That was just... That was just for fun. You know, that's that's a goofy thing. Maybe he could laugh at this movie. But yeah, for sure, this is a movie that, like, if if you do not, if you love the original movie, like I do, but you hate when a sequel just completely dis like, I really enjoyed watching this movie. I'm not gonna lie, this was a fun time, and if that's how you feel, then you might enjoy this. But if you are like, you know, oh, look how they massacred my boy, do not watch this. This, 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 you are not gonna get anything good out of watching this. And yeah, so you know, the worst thing, according to others, the well has run dry, and it really, like, I am, I am. It is amazing to me that with the all the the weird ideas in this movie. They still don't have a more original plot. Like this, the plot here is still way too derivative and predictable. Anyway, um, yeah, the thing I was most worried about was that it was made by people who didn't care or couldn't do it well. And yeah, um, considering the budget, it really seems like it that this could have been more presentable. But it would probably be less fun then. So, yeah, the thing I was most looking forward to, I, I knew not to have high expectations. So the thing I was most looking forward to was the effects. And, yeah, there's some, there's some decent stuff here. You know, not a spoiler to say there's going to be at least one head that blows up. And, yeah, uh, the trailer gives too much away. I, I only found one. I don't, I don't know that they could have gotten audience interest without spoiling, and 
yeah, if you if you like the trailer, you're more likely to like the movie than if you don't. Honestly, the trailer is kind of worth watching. It's fascinating. Like, it does not tell you what the movie's about other than people with psychic powers. And you can tell that from the title. It's basically like a sizzle reel. Like, they basically just... I don't know if maybe they just were, like... I mean, we don't... The plot isn't that interesting. Um... We've got, like... We've got a minute and a half. We can... We can make a minute and a half of a trailer you want to you want to just do a sizzle reel you want to just like show off all the cool and fun stuff that we got to do on this movie because that could be, that could be i could go for that you know i could i could edit together a sizzle reel because it really like there's no way that you watch it and you like leave feeling like you know like don't get me wrong modern trailers give away too much of the plot but, like, just a basic hint of what the movie is gonna be about, like, I honestly, I don't, I, th I think I'm gonna try to show the trailer to someone else and ask if they have any guess as to what the movie is actually about. Because it really is just, like, they took a bunch of fun stuff from the movie and edited it together. So, the, the cover and posters do not give too much away. I'm not sure I would really say that they give you a good idea of what the movie's like. They make the movie look more serious than it is, so not really. And the... yes, so... Right here on YouTube, I found three clips. The one trailer, no fan trailers, although this really seems like a fan trailer. You, can, you could definitely make a fan trailer for this. If, if I was still, like, big into editing, um, which, you know, because of my back, I don't sit at the computer. The, when I record these, that's the only time I sit at the computer for very long at a time. But yeah, this, this definitely, you could definitely make an entertaining trailer out of this that actually, that wasn't just a sizzle reel. And uh, for review analysis, so that's, yeah, this is not a movie that very many people care about. Um... There are only four pages of Rotten Tomatoes user reviews. Like, usually I copy in the first five because there might be, like, a hundred or more. But to only have four... But, yeah, um, there are only three critic reviews. That's too little to, to for, for them to have a tomato meter rating. This is unrated on Rotten Tomatoes. So you'll have to look to the audience score which is 17%. So that kind of gives an indication. This has more than 500 ratings, which is also not a lot. And the average rating is 2.2 out of 5. Wow. So for those who might not know, basically, you know, it's it's binary on Rotten Tomatoes. If you, if you rate it above 3.5, that's a, a plus to the rating. Anything under, so 3.4 or below, that's an, a negative. So that means that 83% of the people who voted on this voted less than 3.5, and the average rating is 2.2. So that's, yeah, this is, this is not a particularly well-received movie. And it's such a small movie that it's not on Metacritic at all. On IMDb, there are only 25 IMDb user reviews. Eight of them have spoilers. So I just read all of them normally. I just read the top voted 100, but yeah. And and yeah, this wasn't one where I really cared about spoilers. And it's still, like, the, the written word does not convey how goofy this movie is. So of the 25 reviews, three of them gave it 1 out of 10, one gave it 2, one gave it three, two gave it four, two gave it five, three gave it six, three gave it seven, four gave it eight, nobody gave it nine, but ten gave it ten. So, yeah, that's a choice. Of the of the 57 links in the IMDb external review section, 20 of eight of them worked and were in English. This has a 4.4 on IMDb out of ten. 2,257 IMDb users have given, have voted on it, and 
Yeah, uh, 19.8 gave it 4, 19.5 gave it 5, 15.0 gave it 3, 12.4 gave it 6, 8.8, 2, 7.9, 1, 7.5, 7, 5.1, 10, 2.88, and 1.29. So, yeah. It was nominated for a Chainsaw Award for Best Independent or Direct-to-Video Film. So it was direct to Anyway. Uh, at the Fangoria Chainsaw Awards in 1992. But it did not win. So the... Yeah, the special effects... Uh, let's see... Yeah. I have a critic quote here. The only major interest point in the film is that the special effects are still top-notch and far more frequent than any other entry in the series. It's a shame that the film and acting are so mind-numbing. And, yeah... Um, it definitely, yeah, they are, they are good, and the, um, yeah, there's, there's a, there's a lot of scanning in this movie, so if that's what you want, you know, maybe they knew that this was going to be the last one, so they were just like, okay, maybe, maybe, I've, I can't help but wonder, I feel like this started as, several different sequel scripts and someone was like we're not going to get to make more than one but people worked on this script let's see if we can combine them into because honestly i if the movie didn't need alex to leave america at the start of the movie like i could see how that could have been like the fourth scanners movie he goes to thailand and like yeah, maybe, maybe the entire movie is him in Thailand. You know, they had to change something, at least, and, they, yeah, that didn't really happen here. There's some really good stunt work here. And, yeah, so the violence, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to take the violence seriously in this movie because of the goofy tone, but it is, there is some, you know, scanners heads are gonna blow up um yeah it's it does a decent enough job like i said maybe it's more the tone now uh, yeah some some tone but also some like the individual effects and the the way they chose to handle it i would recommend the the second one over this but yeah the sexual material is completely gratuitous um i think an argument could be made that it's trying at least some of the time to to communicate something with it but it really isn't it just it doesn't quite work you know and i've always you know i i think it is fine to have you know ba basically mature content in movies i think it can be okay if it's just like for fun i think it's ideal if you're saying something with the violence the sex drugs, uh, language, these kinds of things, you know, but it, yeah, I, I don't mind if you're using harsh language in a movie without it really saying something. I think that's fine, but I do think, like, the amount of, like, as much as there is in this movie of conventionally attractive women being heavily sexualized it's really not like effectively saying anything it's not really and it, i like i swear someone working on this had a vision for using female sexuality to convey ideas and i'll talk about them in the spoiler section and I don't know if it's just, like, eventually it got really diluted in the final script. Yeah, I could... And that's also, like, I could totally see how you could make an entire Scanners movie. Because part of the thing with Scanners is they can control your mind. You know, that's... The... the there is a, um, you know... There, there is an aspect of sexuality that is very much in of of the mind, you know, 
So it is like I could definitely I could see a movie. I could see a I, I could see a feminist scanner movie with at least one major female character that really comments on sexuality and uses female sexuality to to you know for its themes and such. And yeah, you know, they were like we're only going to get to make one more of these movies, so let's just throw everything together. And we end up with this really diluted it's 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 fascinating. It is legitimately fascinating. And yeah, um, I I'm not 100% certain if this has multiple DVD releases. The one I own just has subtitles, scene selections, and a still image gallery from the film. That's that's it. There's nothing else on there. I, I don't. It doesn't even have like a trailer for itself. You know, I had to go to YouTube for that. And this was back when they would almost always put trailers on. You know. But, but yeah, and actually, um, it's the one, I don't know if it's super obvious, but it's the one I put there. When I bought it, it came without a cover. Even the, the second movie had a cover. I, bu I bought the, they were a, a package deal, which also makes you wonder, like, why didn't they just put both discs in the one cover? But they didn't, you know, and, and they actually... I don't know if it's like someone at the at the company I bought it from was like kind of embarrassed or fearing a lawsuit or something but they they put like a little piece of paper with the the, the cover that said we're not ripping you off not not verbatim it's it's something like please note that when you bought it we said it wasn't going to have a proper cover this is the this is still the real DVD Some, something along those lines you know and just yeah and it's it's weird because I bought the first Predator movie from the same company, and it also didn't have a cover. And again, this like, please don't sue us kind of note. And then I put, you know, then then I, you know, lift the first disc. Oh, it it is a two disc. I thought I thought it said that on the page, but now it doesn't have a cover. So, okay, I guess I'll, you know, put the disc in, and it has like so many special, you know, so many special features. They needed two discs. It's not the movie itself that has two discs. You know, the movie is on the one disc, but... And there's, like, a commentary track and, like, a, a trivia track and, like, long documentaries about the movie, like... But no cover, for, for some reason. Anyway. Apparently, you can stream this on Tubi. And... Yeah. Uh, okay, so... I like to call myself a film cricket, so I guess I have to be brutally honest and say this is this is a four out of ten. But if we're just talking about entertainment value, I rate this seven pointless uses of psychic powers out of ten. This was very entertaining, very goofy from start. Like honestly, if it wasn't consistently goofy, I would probably. I, I think it would have really bothered me, but it is just, like, you know, it's way too violent of a movie to show a child, but it feels like it was made for, like, children's entertainment with how goofy it is. Like, the the villains of this feel like they walked out of, like, I mean, even, like, at the, mo at the goofiest, Shredder and Krang and... I don't really remember. Actually, yeah, better example. I remember a lot of Bebop and Rocksteady. They could be really goofy. I think, yeah, yeah, honestly, if... If the villains from this guest appeared in an, in an episode of the 1987 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they would have fit right in. Like, they were... I guess they would have to animate them, but that's... You know, only one of them is is a woman, and we know women are too hard to animate. But the the yeah, it's it's from the right perspective, it's fun. So yeah, um, I guess overall, this is probably 
just figuring out because I actually yeah I expected it to end up there but yeah so so yeah updated worst to best ranking and I want to emphasize that the the placement of this particular movie is not based on its objective value as of, of how well made of a movie it is it is based on how entertaining it is the rest of them are based on whether or not they're well made so yeah worst to best of christian duguay's directing yeah entries scanners 2 livewire boot camp scanners 3 hitler the rise of evil and human trafficking and with that that brings us to the wow i've been going for longer than i thought i would end up that brings us to the thoughts section so spoilers from here on out so this the first section notes taken while watching is oh hold on i guess i will just there we go yeah the first section is in chronological order you know, th thoughts that I had while watching, you can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like, and the final section is thoughts that I had before watching, but yeah, the rest of this is like MST3K riff tracks and other jokes, and also some analysis. So, one of the things that make me say that this is not quite feminist is that the supposed good guy alex is literally like the, right at the very start the 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 other guy the the guy dressed as santa is like trying to you know trying to convince him you know show off with the the scanner's powers and then this woman passes by and says something like oh actually no wait yeah for a second, I was, yeah, I was misremembering. It wasn't the one, he wasn't upset with the one that didn't believe them. But he said that he wasn't going to show off. And then she calls him a party pooper. And then he, like, I, I think it's supposed to be, like, that he's pinching her ass. It's certainly some kind of, you know, yeah, sexual assault. Mild sexual assault. Sure, but still sexual assault. And this is the good guy. Like, I don't know why... Why would you have that as the, or or is it supposed to, maybe in an, uh, maybe in another draft, he was supposed to like, turn. Evil, or it was, or is it saying that all men, no matter how good they are, view women as sex objects, because certainly I I, I am aware that is one school of feminist thought, um, that that it. Yeah, it, it just, the rest of the movie, he's fighting the bad guys and protecting civilians and innocents, you know, he takes care to not hurt people that, because, you know, Helen is just constantly, like, killing people that are just slightly in her way or bothering her or such, but Alex takes care to only, like, when Alex is... When, when he needs someone to help him, and they aren't going to, you know, yeah, he'll use the scanning, but he's he doesn't hurt people that aren't, you know, evil. And he does hurt evil people. He, you know, he kills some of the, the evil scanners, so. Let's see. And, yeah, uh, Santa goes flying off the, the building. I guess it's supposed to be funny that the, like, there's like a child... You know, Santa lands right in front of him, clearly dead. And he's like, Santa. And it's just, there's no, like, because I thought it's going to be like, Santa's dead, you know. But no, there's just Santa, and that's it. And it's just, okay. Uh, I, I don't, is is it, was it originally supposed to be that they were horrified? And then the someone at the network were like, oh, you can't, you can't do that. 
but but we do like you know it is kind of funny that you know that's you it's the kind of thing that's going to get you know if if people are like renting this movie this that's maybe the kind of thing that like even if they turn off the movie early they might actually tell someone else you know dude you got to watch you got to rent this movie santa goes flying off a building and dies right in front of a child you have to see you know I, I guess that's maybe what they were doing there, because, like, because honestly, based on this movie, you'd think that what they showed really early on was, like, a sex scene or something. Certainly, there's a lot of sex scenes later on, so it just, yeah, um, and the, the Christmas music resumes playing after Santa died, and just, yeah, and... Then there's this thing about that, like, Helen is is struggling with the headache because she forgot her pill. And, like, you know, I, I get it. Obviously, when she forgets to take her pill, she has these attacks of rampant exposition delivering. And, like, like, she's talking about, oh, this is why I get the migraines, this is why I can't hold down a job. But she is holding down a job, so I guess someone combining scripts missed that part. She has a job with Mark Dragon. You know, she's apparently a really big deal. He won't give her the respect, so she can hold down a job. And she even says, no, no, I did this. This is, like, it's because of me that this huge thing is going to, you know... But yeah, like, I, I guess I feel like if those, because, cause like, if that's the kind of stuff she runs into when she forgets the pill, why is she still forgetting the pill? Like, I, there's stuff that I, you know, I, I don't take medication against that kind of thing, but, like, when I, when I have a headache and I'm taking a headache pill every six hours, you know, throughout an entire day, I sure as hell don't forget to take it. I don't forget, like, yeah, I, I, and, and I can't help but wonder, is it supposed to be like a misogynist joke about women forgetting to take their birth control pill? Or is it just, yeah. Let's see. Um, and, uh, what was the, um, yeah, yeah, and then we get the, the flashback to when she's 12 years old and the the doctor is, like, abusing her. And, and like, again, yeah, yeah, like, there is this thing of... Because that also... That also... It's almost the theme in this movie that, like, if you are a scanner, which, you know, the first movie, you can read it... Yeah, in the first movie, it, it basically fits, like, maybe schizophrenia or something. You know, it's it's a it's a mental health diagnosis, and a lot of people, are, you know, if, if you have an undiagnosed mental illness, a lot of people end up unhoused. You know, if they can't get treatment for it, you know, they can't hold down a job, they can't pay rent, and they end up unhoused. And, yeah, you know, if you... So, so yeah, um... In this movie, we see that they were abused, and you know Helen even tells the the stepfather Elton, you know he's. Well, I think she calls. I think she says that he's a pervert. And Elton is like, I know, I'm sorry. There's just there's not a lot of people working with scanners, so you know, and and I mean that's even that's that's actually an interesting that's. Sadly true, there are a number of issues where some of the people working there, working with them, you know, because it's such, it's so unusual, it's, it's very difficult to, to find something to, to work with that isn't being kind of messed up about it. And like, you know, there's a, there's a long history of the the you know the field of psychiatry the the field of mental health of 
like basically treating people extremely badly. You know, for a while they thought, oh, you know, if someone like they would they would lock people, they would they would fully isolate people, which led to you know if, if they were like um, being um, ah, what's it called? Like like pr prisoners would be fully isolated, which would you know, actually lead to mental illness because it's not, you're not supposed to be fully isolated. And they would, yeah, you know, they they would, the kinds of things they would do to, to mental health patients was horrendous. And it feels like, you know, maybe this movie is actually trying to discuss that because that, at the end of the day, uh, I, I love the first movie and I, I don't know if it would have fit the first movie doesn't really get into, like, it touches upon what people, once they know their diagnosis, what they can do to, to address it. Uh, you know, so you have the, the artist who gets the stuff out of his head by making it into art. You have the, the collective who, who scan together, scan each other. And, and, you know, you have the corporation that's trying to take advantage of the, the scanning but it didn't really get into uh, like the the medical history, and it, there wasn't really room for it. I think it could have, yeah, you could have done it in this movie, but Doctor Bauman is barely in it, and there's just there's the one flashback, and and then yeah, because actually the 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 evil scanners are torturing Alex with the the scanning thing, the the uh, not yeah. The, the laser thing in, in his eyes, so it actually doesn't, I don't know, I mean, I guess there's there is that theme of, there, there's the, the notion that Alex as a good person, you know, tries to avoid hurting others, and feels really bad about the one person he accidentally killed, and then you have the evil scanners who are just killing and torturing everywhere they go, kind of thing, so, so you know, that's... But that doesn't really, yeah, it's just, it's a movie that raises these interesting concepts and then does nothing with them, which is, like, I don't need bad movies to get interesting. I, I, that's fine, you know. I can watch a bad movie that's just fun, that isn't especially interesting, but why bring them up if you're not going to do anything? And I really, it feels like originally there was, like, at least one of the scripts that were combined for this was intelligent. Like, someone writing for this had ideas. They watched the Cronenberg movie, and they thought, we can we can use this to explore. And let's see. Yeah, so the, you know, Helen is out of pills in her own bottle, which is, again, like, I've never run out of the the um, headache pills. Never in my life. Uh, that is just... Or, yeah, I have occasionally had trouble, you know, buying as many as I needed. But I've never... Oh, you know, well, last time I... T when you take one and you can tell it's the last in the bottle, replace the bottle. Like, it's... And my headaches are nowhere near as bad as the, the scanners. And then, you know, she, she drops the, the, you know, there is one in the, in the refrigerator, which makes you wonder, do they need to be refrigerated? Because in that case, it's a bad idea to keep one in your nightstand. Because, it, yeah, it's, it's, again, it's just convenient writing. Like, they needed her to use the patch. So... Yeah, she has one more bottle. They did realize it would be ridiculous if she didn't have at least one more bottle. Like, nobody who suffers from headaches that, like that actually has the... Just, yeah. And she uh, she blows up a pigeon, which I don't even know. Is that even supposed to... I guess it's the first sign that she's evil. Because, like, you're not supposed to blow up pigeons... You can poison them in the park, but that's a different, uh, you know, approach. I, yeah, it was, it was just kind of, yeah, I guess it was just they wanted to, to show off. Let's, ah, we can blow up a pigeon and that kind of thing. And then, let's see. And, and yeah, when, when, like, when the, when Elton 
and I am gonna find his name real quick. Uh, let's see. So it was. Oh, that's too far. When Elton talks about Alex with Michael, he actually like that's a decently written scene. That's not terrible writing. You know, it is legitimate. You know, he talks about like I'm I'm worried I I lost Alex. You know, and this this like it, movie you just blew up a pigeon. And, like, the next thing is dragon dancing and stripping in a fancy restaurant. You just, like, how are you, how are you sandwiching in this? Because, because, like, he literally, some of what he said was, I guess as a foster parent, you're always worried about losing your adoptive children. And that, yeah, like, I, I've never, you know, I'm not adopted, and I myself haven't adopted anyone. I never really thought about it, but yeah, I guess that is actually, you know, yeah, I, I, can, I can imagine. That is, because, you know, there, it is, yeah, I, I, that was actually interesting, and then, you know, right after, it's this, just, yeah. And, uh, yeah, uh, you know, dr we meet Dragon, he's really full of himself, he doesn't respect Helen, and first she makes him... I, I actually, I will admit, I, I didn't hate everything about the scene. Not, or not, I, I don't know that I hated it. Not everything about the scene was just completely ridiculous, but, you know, because first she's like... I want to talk to them because I did this. This is me. This is my work. I put effort into this. You didn't do anything. And you're just going to take all the credit. So, you know, he's introducing himself. And he's got the the the, the, the champagne glass. And she uses the, the psychic powers to make him spill on himself. And then, like, you know... And, and then she quickly introduces herself to them and, like... I, I think she was thinking he's going to go and wash off the, the champagne and I'm going to have some time with these people so I can talk about my work. You know, if, if I didn't, if I didn't want to talk about my work, why would I be, you know, I'm, I work really hard on this. I want to discuss my work. You know, I'm proud of this. But then he's like, how about you get some more champagne to her? And then... You know, okay, I mean, at this point, at that point, what, what else do you do? You use your psychic powers to make him dance and strip, you know, and, and just, like, I was, like, dude sells it, you know, he really just, yeah, he was, he, Dragon was a lot of fun watching, and, yeah, uh, um, let's see. Yeah, honestly, you know, her, her making him dance was probably the first time that I really thought, okay, the scanning in this movie is also kind of dumb, like, in the second one, you know, because before this, uh, let's see, we had the, we had the big attack, e e or, yeah, you know, him throwing, accidentally throwing Santa out the window was also kind of silly, but at, at least it was just, like, it was, it was kind of an exaggerated, like, I mean, essentially, you know, if, if scanning was a handgun, that's an accidental discharge, you know, the, the, so, so it is this thing of, you know, you have this power, if you're not re really careful, you might hurt people, you know, as, so just, yeah. Let's see, yeah, and, and Helen comes back to, you know, she, she reminds Dr. Bauman who she is. And they keep pointing out the fact that she's Polish. I, I was wondering if that was going to keep coming back. Because the is it the first time that she's talking? Maybe. No, wait, yeah, yeah, actually, that's the thing. It's, I guess it's the first time she has a lot of lines. The first time she's talking at the party, I don't think she says anything about Poland. But then, you know, when they're walking down, the, right before she has her migraine and says, you know, I forgot to take my pill. 
Then she's talking about, you know, oh, you know, this little Polish girl, she's not going to wear red underwear, which is also, that's not terrible setup because later she is, you know, sexualizing herself all over the place. So it, it changes her personality, you know, which is very war on drugs propaganda. Like, that's not, like, drugs, like, make you... Some drugs can really change your your personality, but a lot of stuff of like you know, you you maybe become your worst self, but you don't stop being who you. As as far as I understand, I've I've never done drugs, but like the the kinds of drugs that they're worried about kids doing, you know, like yeah, you know, heroin and coke and such. You know, you you become your worst self, but you're still basically the same person. So it is just yeah. Anyway. Let's see, the, the, um, yeah, you know, so, so, yeah, there she says, you know, oh, Polish girl, and then she goes to Dr. Bauman, remember the 12-year-old little Polish girl, and it's like, I thought the first time it was supposed to explain, wait, why does she have that accent, because obviously, we, you know, it would be pretty ridiculous for them to, re to, to pretend she was just like, I don't know, from Maine or something, you know, no, no, she is clearly from somewhere else. You know, and, and Polish accent, it doesn't really sound like it's from anywhere other than Poland. You know, so, so yeah, no disrespect to, to Polish people. Um, so, so yeah, you know, the, the, um, let's see, the, the, um, yeah, so, uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, you know, at at first Bauman is like, oh, you know, he's he's just like, you 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 can't be in here, kind of, and and it's you know, okay, but then she reminds him who, and he's like, you were a brat then and you haven't changed, and it's just like, wow, and and then you know she she blows up his finger to make him stop wagging it, which. Like I said in the review, it was pretty ridiculous how he was wagging that thing. Um, maybe he thought he had a yo-yo, and he was trying to do a sick move with it. Anyway, um, yeah, then, then you know, she, she takes a Polaroid of his head as, as she blows his head up. Which, like, I mean, I guess at this point, you kind of, you got to do something different with it. Because we've seen heads blow, you know, when, the, when a head blew up at the start, you know, second scene of the first scanners yeah okay that was you know but by now we kind of we've seen it we gotta you gotta do something more with it you know and yeah taking a polaroid just yeah and she fights off some orderlies and uh hands out f3 patches to the other patients and they also, like, go from being, like, kind of, uh, what's the word? Like, they, they seem a little shy. One, you know, the first one can barely get the words out. Like, you could be in trouble for this, kind of, you know. But then it doesn't, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, again, they just, you know, they go from being sweet to demonic. And... Yeah, you know, she says, basically, we, we have to get revenge for being put at the bottom of society. For, be, you know, and it is, like, I I noticed that they used the, um, I forget if, let's see, is the term... Uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, it is offensive, so I ah uh, crap. Okay, yeah, yeah. The the um um yeah. They take a special needs bus and basically weaponize it. You know, they're chasing the the good guy. The the evil scanners chase the good scanner. And they're using the special needs bus. Yeah, 
that was that was legitimately and and you know the production bothered to to write the what was it like Bau, Bau, Bauman Clinic across it you know so it like they didn't just happen to find no no, no they they planned for this you know just yeah because that is you know when you know there there are so many jokes about the special needs bus the the you know that's why i had to google to see if the you know there's a there's a there's a slang term for it that is offensive so i won't be using it here but you know, yeah, there's there's a lot of really mean-spirited jokes about the special needs bus. So, yeah, taking it and turning it into a, a tool to fight back. Because, you know, they're fighting Alex so that they can take over the world. They know that he is going to stop them if they don't stop him. So, that, yeah, like, that someone working on this had ideas. Uh, you know, possibly multiple people. And let's see. Yeah, and I think if if I recall, I think it's the monk telling uh, uh, Alex, "You have to decide if the scanning is a curse or a gift." And I'm just like, "Can it be both? Like a fuck you for Christmas?" And let's see. Yeah, yeah. And then we have the the infamous scene where Helena is taking a she's she's in the the hot tub and the father comes down and they get like kind of freudian and yeah it's just it's it's a uh, i don't i d i appreciate the, the bit about, you know, she points out that he always said that Alex was supposed to take over. You know, you needed a little boy. You, you needed a boy to take care of the company once you were gone. And you needed a girl. But you never told me why. And, and you know, yeah, she's basically, she's jealous of Alex. And he, I also don't know why he feels it when she scans Elton, because it, it happens again later. At first, I was like, oh, when when she scans their adoptive father, he can feel it. But no, he can feel it that other time also, but he couldn't before. So it's just... Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. She feels like their father never believed... You know, he didn't think that she could become something important, basically. And... That is an issue. There are a lot of young women who grow up and realize, wow, dad really doesn't think highly of me at all. He doesn't think that I can, you know, make something of myself. And the movie is tackling this important issue whilst, a, you know... A father is looking at his naked adoptive daughter in a hot tub, and she's like, please come join me in the hot tub, and she ends up drowning him in the hot tub. And it's just like, what even, what are you doing, movie? Like, you're, you're either trying to tackle this important issue, or you're being goofy, but somehow the movie tries to have it both ways, and it's just, it is fascinating. I was never, I was never bored for a second of watching this. And, yeah, like, later, you know, like, the lawyer is like, but he hated the hot tub. And f at first, I was like, why did he have a hot tub? Oh, wait, I guess. Because, you know, that's not where... Wait a second, does she still live with the father? Or did she go there? No, no, that, yeah, that's right, yeah. She lives somewhere else, but she went to the father in order to... Or did he visit her... And because because the patches are in the house where she sleeps. Yeah. Anyway, a uh, lot of plot points in this movie. Uh, I guess I missed one. But anyway, no, you know, he has one for other people, you know, maybe for guests or, you know, if if it's the home that he that that Alex and Helena grew up in. Yeah. You know, maybe he had it 
so that they could use it. You know, that doesn't mean anything but by itself. But, but yeah, it's just... Like, if you wanted this thing of, like... I don't mind the Freudian thing. I'm just... It doesn't really go anywhere, you know? It doesn't... The, the This whole... The... the um, there's never a proper... Like, it doesn't, it doesn't lead to anything that's, like, really meaningful. This whole... The, the sexual thing. It, you know, it, it kind of feels like just... This, this idea that, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I guess I'll talk about that in the, let's see, I, I'm certain that I wrote something, let's see, yeah, yeah, the, the, um, hmm. Yeah, I think I will just talk about the the issue with the um let's see. Yes. I think I will talk about it in the in the next section because I have some prepared notes there, but just put a pin in it. And yeah, uh you know, when when Alex is talking to Mark he says, my, my master says that death is a part of karma, which, I mean, that shows that someone writing this went beyond the white concept of karma, because newsflash, our, the, the popular white idea of karma is very different from the actual original idea, which is, you know, it's, I, f I forget, I think it was maybe College Humor who made a video where they titled it we white people it, where, you know, white people will discover something that other cultures have already, you know, it's already a thing, but white people will discover it and dilute it and just, yeah. And the scanner that follows Mark to, to Thailand to stop Alex, I got a real discount Shades Alvarez vibe off of, and I, like... Why he needs the shades because of the light. And so do some of the other scanners. But not Helen, even though she still has the... She doesn't like sunlight. And it's just like, what? what is... I, I mean, the only thing I can think of is that someone working on it was like, we can't put shades on her because, you know, we the, the she won't be as sexy or something like that. But just, yeah. And, yeah, like, this was when I noted, the, the film has these trace amounts of feminism, like, women aren't in control, men are, and, like, it's not, like, the, the movie presents us, like, it's not a good thing that Dragon has more power than Helen, because Helen is the one doing all the work, and Dragon, he doesn't appreciate her, he's a jerk, you know, he's really full of himself, even though he didn't actually do anything, apparently, you know. So, just, yeah. But it, ultimately, it, yeah, it doesn't really go anywhere. The, let's see, yeah, then we have the, 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 um, scanner versus martial arts fights, which was, you know, fun. I don't really have anything else to say to that. Why did only one of the evil scanners follow the... Let's... Yeah, right. One of the things with the, the feminism, I mean, the the prominent woman... The, yeah, so there's basically two prominent women. Helen, who's a, a killer, and Joyce, who really doesn't do very much... Like, she's there to tell Alex... Like, like yeah, she helps figure out some of the some of what's going on, and she follows to the the final fight. But then she just gets knocked out, and doesn't participate in the climax in any meaningful way. You know, but they do manage to get her naked, and and I forget was there also a sex scene? Yeah, yeah, I think it did. Get, it it ended up morphing into a sex scene. Also, Alex and and Joyce, 
you know, there's there there isn't a good woman in in the movie who has a prominent role. Yeah, and then yeah, then you have the the um, you know, first she pretends to be a receptionist, then she pretends to be a nurse. You know, and she's clearly just there for the, like, just, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, she's there for, for sex appeal and, and maybe the, the theme, but I'll, I'll get to that when I get to it. The, yeah, you know, why does, why does only one scanner follow, you know, go, go to Thailand to stop Alex? What were the other scanners doing? Telepath, telekinetically twiddling their thumbs? Like... It's not like they had anything else to do. The only thing they do the entire movie is try to, you know, they, they yeah, they try to stop Alex. That's literally, they, they don't, and, and it's such, it's such an easy fix. Just have them be like, maybe, okay, I guess Helen doesn't really need, she doesn't need them to, as, as like muscle to go around with her, but have, yeah, have it be that, she, okay, I don't really want them to go instead of her for scenes where to, to do legwork but that could be a thing but no they just because like yeah if, you know first we see oh there's like half a dozen of them at the at the bauman clinic and then only one of them goes to thailand he ends up dead then when alex comes back wait was there other no if, if i recall correctly there was only one of them that went to thailand and then he used the the um I, i'm not gonna Go ahead and guess, but martial artists of some kind. He used them to help fight Alex, and then when Alex goes back to America, then all the others help fight Alex, and, you know, they're chasing him down in the, the special needs bus, and they're shooting at him, and all this stuff, and I'm like, why didn't more than one of them go to Thailand? They knew that he was going to be a problem. That's why they s sent someone to kill him in the first place. Like, it's just, it... Again, it's convenient, bad, right? It's it's convenient, bad decisions made by... Because Helen otherwise seems to be very smart. And... Let's see... Yeah, and like... Then we see that Helen is this really aggressive corporate leader. Which makes me wonder if there's like a strain of... Capitalist critique going on in the movie also. But that also doesn't go anywhere. Like, just... Yeah. I just, you know, just notice that... It's not evil to be a CEO, because Elton was, but it is evil to be a really harsh CEO, which Helen is. So it is drawing that, you know, the, the movie says, I don't know that I really believe that you can be a CEO and do good. That's not really a, yeah, anyway. But, but, um, yeah, so, you know, it's, it's definitely trying to do something hold on what was the other thing I want to, oh right that comes up later yeah and we're yeah we we find out you know oh helen didn't used to be so impulsive says alex well what changed was it because she forgot the pills because the impulsive thing he's talking about was from before the patch so it's, it's yeah yeah wasn't the her putting on the patch that was impulsive so what happened to cause and it never goes there. It never does anything with that. Uh, let's see. And the yeah, you have the um, uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah. The the um, um, let's see. What was the other thing? Um, Oh, yeah, I guess that was it. Yeah, and the because Helen is, uh, like, really aroused, she also makes the people on the live TV aroused. And I would like to politely call bullshit on the idea that live television would continue to go after they started saying things like that. They would immediately cut. And be like, okay, we gotta get them off the the set and figure something else out. But they're not gonna. Anyway, I'm not saying the movie's realistic otherwise, but just yeah. And yeah, she realized that she can scan via TV, which that is legitimately like uh, that's a that's an interesting escalation of the the. 
you know, it's it's more of a video drone thing than a than a scanner thing, but it is there is at least, yeah. And you know, if if they're gonna keep making scanners movies, they really have to, um, yeah, you know, they have to go new places. They have there have to be new ideas. Otherwise, just keep watching the same movie over and over. You know, there's no reason to watch. A lesser version of the same movie and uh, yeah Alex learns of Helen's powers because of uh, you know through the VHS tape so it's even even you it doesn't even she doesn't even have to be actively doing it she can record on VHS and th and again like that holy you could do something with that you know, I mean, even even live TV isn't going to be as much. You or wait, was she gonna mass produce VHS? No, wait, no, she never even finds out, does she? That the VHS can. So it's just, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, and then Alex goes to the Bauman clinic, and the receptionist seduces him, and then. They make a joke out of false rape accusations, which is just... There are, statistically speaking, there is almost all of the rape accusations that are made are real, not false. But, you know, yeah, in, in the 90s, the, that wasn't really accepted to be the case yet. And, yeah... You know, there's they, they use the the lasers on his eyes, and he I forget explodes the machine or something, and there's a big laser light show, and yeah, um, we have the the special needs bus motorcycle chase, and and you know they put this filter on some of the footage because his eyes are readjusting, so that makes it even more tense because you know. Riding a motorcycle by itself, you know, clearly he's done this before, so that's not... But if he's, you know, plus he's being shot at and this whole thing. And there's some underwater scanning, which is also really goofy looking. And he blows up the head and you see the burst up out of the water. And he explains that... He explains to Joyce that rage builds in... Uh, if, if a scanner starts to lose control, so that helps explain why Helen is, you know, getting increasingly out of control. And I don't know why he felt the need to say it's like a rage instead of just saying it's rage. Because you're trying to make this sound more complicated. What you're describing is rage. You know, it's, it's not like it's completely unfounded. It, it's not like he has to sell the idea to her. She's already, you know, she, she believes he's, you know. Like, if he was trying to tell a person who never heard of Scanners, and he tries to use other words, but yeah, anyway. And, uh, let's see. Ah, uh, crap, what does that mean? Um, I, oh, oh, right, the, yeah, the, the patch stops working, but within, like, two minutes, she has the solution via the, the VHS tape, so, yeah, that was a bit of really pointless tension there, like, and, and she is like, oh, what have I done, but then she still uses it right after, like, why didn't she just make sure to take pills after? Because that's... I feel like the movie never really addresses that. And if I missed it, please put it in the comments. But why does she... I get why she does it the first time. The first time she puts on the, the F3 patch, she doesn't realize it's going to change who she is. But as soon as the first... That first patch... Or wait, no. Not first patch... Yeah, because he said it lasts for 24 hours. 
that's definitely more than 24 hours later that we see it stop. So why didn't she just have it ready? She's still forgetting pills, I guess, is is the... But, but yeah, the... the um, why did she put on a new patch instead of just taking F2 pills? I, I just don't... Or was it F1 pills that they had? I guess I'm not entirely certain about that but it definitely wasn't f3 because f3 is only the patch but but yeah right now i remember the the thing i want to say earlier i guess it's because helen has changed her personality that she didn't realize that it would be a bad story to tell that oh you know dad had a heart attack in the hot tub and drowned because it's like you know the, immediately the lawyer says he hated the hot tub why why would he be you know and it's like why didn't you... You have psychic powers. Just have him do something that he does all the time and have him do it in a way that he ends up dead from it. And then you can say, you know, because most accidents happen in the home. Most accidents happen when you're doing something you think you've done a million times before, kind of thing, you know. And let's see... Yeah, and, you know, Alex and Joyce are together on the bed, and, like, Joyce is focusing, and she's like, okay, so we gotta do this, this, and this. You know, and Alex is like, you know, and he does end up convincing her, and they have sex, but it's like, you know you could save the world first. Like, it's not, she's not gonna poof out of existence if you stop your sister. Like, that's, that's a completely, uh, yeah, it's, it's... And, and, let's see, um, yeah, and, you know, Alex almost falls off a building because of the other scanner, and it's like, why was he standing at the edge of the build? I, no, no, yeah, I was about to say, no, this, actually, this isn't the first time he encounters them, because uh, they, they, they chased him in the bus, so he, he knew that there are scanners out there looking for him, trying to kill him, and he just stands at the edge of just, yeah. Yeah, and then it's the first, first the, he's almost falling off and he's like holding on and then he gets up and then run, runs for a while and there's uh, submachine gun fire and grenades and then he gets knocked off. So it's like the entire scene was basically pointless. You could just have started with him being knocked off. And, and again, like all you had to do was have him not be almost knocked off at the start of the scene. If if the um, just imagine if he was like prepared for a fight and they come and they fight and then it ends with him being thrown off, but he wasn't ready for a fight even though he really should be. You know, it's just it's easier to write scenes like that if you can if you're allowed to make the characters act like they don't know that they're in danger, even though you know he appears to be a smart guy. And yeah, like uh, at the end of the day, like the whole thing with the with the Buddhism, it doesn't go anywhere. Like, I guess like the only real uh, um, consequence of of the whole thing, other than the fact that he was not in America, so Helen could do a bunch of shady shit while he was gone. Because it really is like if she started behaving completely unlike herself, and then something happens to their father, and he's there, like he is going to figure out that there's something with her that's, you know, it was also really, really funny when, like, I forget, what was it even she did? Um, Helen did something with her powers. Oh, no, yeah, actually, yeah, she's, like, crushing a fruit in her hands, and Mark has, like, just crossed the corner, and he pops back in and looks, and it's like, that's weird, and then he just leaves. He just leaves. He's not, like, what are you doing? He's just, like, because I guess, yeah, he's, like, mentally... I don't want to be that fruit. I don't want her to crush me like that, so I'm going to go tell on her. I'm going to be a little tattletale. Go to the 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 tattletale travel to Thailand to tell on Helen. And just, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, and, and yeah, so ultimately Alex does fall off, and he is, you know, and, and now the, you know, Former patient, current receptionist, or, yeah, former patient, pretended to be a receptionist, now nurse. But if she, wait, what, if she was a patient, I guess maybe they went somewhere else and got other 
scanners. Not all of them are former patient of Bauman's. But then why would they work if they're not Bauman patients? Wait, does that mean that all of them... Wait, are there a bunch of off-screen scanners that the movie never addresses that would be happy to work with them? Because it really seemed to me like everyone that was working... I only bring it up because the... I guess I... I feel bad about not using her name, so I'm going to... Okay, so the, the, yeah, so the character's played by Claire. Susie. The character of Susie specifically to, oh, okay, I, I don't know, I guess it's possible that she was lying to, um, it's possible that she was lying to, to Alex, but she says that the breasts aren't fake, are, are not real. Would Bauman really, okay, you know what, he's a pervert, I guess he would be like, you know what, you should get fake breasts. Fair enough. But yeah, and, and you know, she's about to, to kill him, and the reason that it's her going, rather than one of the, the other hitmen, you know, in part because she can pass for a nurse, but also, you know, she gets them to lower their guard, including, including Alex himself. So, you know, she uses, she's about to use the shot, and then he, like, fakes... A heart attack, which, you know, I mean, usually I only do that to get out of talking to family, but anyway, yeah, the, the, that's a joke. Because she was about to give him the shot, and then she can't when they think that he's dead, and it's good, you know, that's, that's the only thing that actually comes out of the the buddhist thing that that he stops his own heart which i forget i think that might be a, a thing that they get full control of their their body I, do, I don't know that much about buddhism but the the yeah like you know the the entire thailand sequence is basically there because someone really wanted a story set in thailand and honestly, I can imagine, like, the Thailand script probably had, like, a ton of stuff like that. You know, in one scene, he stops his heart. In another, it's some other kind of, you know... May yeah, maybe he, like, uses his scanning to stop other people's organs to, to you know, to, to stop them faster or something, you know, but just, yeah. And see, it, it seems like there is, the, there's certainly a reoccurring thing. I don't know if it's an intentional theme. There's a reoccurring thing where women will use, you know, men's weakness. The, the, um, uh, we straight men have the weakness for sex and attract, you know, conventionally attractive women can use that to, you know, con control us. Helen does it and Susie does it. But again, it doesn't really end up going anywhere, and the movie doesn't sexualize Joyce less, and she isn't trying to... Actually, yeah, it, if she wants Alex to focus and, like, make a plan, why didn't she get dressed first? You know, the, the only answer is male gaze. There's no other... just... yeah. And... Yeah, so Alex stops his heart... We go to the autopsy and classic music. I gotta say, the fake out got me. I was like, no, don't cut into Alex. And then it shows that, no, no, he was, he was cutting into another body, you know. And it's, you know, it's fair enough because we didn't, like, they didn't show his face and then he's, like, drawing where he's going to cut. It showed a body and we assumed it was Alex because we, we knew that his body was in there, but we didn't. So it's, yeah, that worked. I... Yeah, it was, it was, it was fun. And, uh, yeah, Helen, you know, so, yeah, Helen's on TV and she, like, you know, makes a, uh, football player get hurt or something. Why was she on TV before she started controlling people through the scanning? Because, like, I, I 100, you know, I get she wants, you know, of course, she wants control of the world, and 
that's the yeah you know and and it's actually it's a again there's a there's a smidgen of commentary if we didn't all watch television she wouldn't be able to control us it's a it's again pointing to you know this is basically a weakness of ours you know today we are you know there's there's screens all around us i realize the irony of me saying that into a camera so that i can appear on someone else's screen but it doesn't really go anywhere and i i why was she why was she on tv before she started controlling them i, I know i said that before but to f finish the thought she kept showing up and like saying i have a big surprise for people and it's like i get you know for film from a filmmaking perspective obviously they're raising you know if she just shows up and controls people immediately you know that's that's one thing but she keeps appearing and we the viewer who know she can control people through tv are like here it comes here it comes oh no you know but you have to actually have her like why is she is what i'm saying what what is her motivation for delivering movie buildup and let's see yeah so um yeah the the um, yeah, yeah the climax when when helen uses the the light thing against alex that's not bad that's legitimately an interesting and like i know how movies like this go so i would have been extremely surprised if she did actually win but for a second there it looked or more than a second you know for maybe a minute or two there, it looked like she might win, you know, and that was kind of cool. And then I'm like, why haven't the other scanners been trying to use light again? Like they they tortured him in the in the Bauman Institute, sure, but as far as like, wasn't there like a uh, an entire cabinet full of the light thing? Or or wait, or was that only the the uh, dark gun thing? But I, I certainly one of the orderlies ran up. And open an entire... And again, like, just don't show us that if you're not going to do anything with it. But just, yeah. A again, if they had it, the, you know, clearly someone working on this wanted scanners to be, you know, using submachine guns and grenade launchers. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not arguing. That's, that's awesome. So, yeah. And let's see... Yeah, uh, the the um, yeah, there there is a little sex, there's a little feminism in the film, but every woman who has very much screen time is sexual. Actually, yeah, I don't think there's a single woman who appears on camera in this movie who is never sexualized. Even the like, there's the the woman who's a guest on live TV. There's Helen. There's Joyce, and again, Joyce isn't trying to use her sexuality to you know gain something so it would actually i mean I'm, i don't know that it would have been better if she like used her you know conventionally attractive looks to distract a scanner or something that would still be misogynist but the fact that it, every woman is sexualized and it doesn't go and you know because because yeah the, the problem is now we end up with a movie where you know, basically the woman on live TV is being sexually assaulted by the scanner power of Helen. And all other women who use their sex, who intentionally use sex appeal to, you know, as a, as a weapon against men, Helen and Susie are both evil. Let's see. So, so you know, it's not serious feminism. And, yeah, uh when when the um and i yeah i do appreciate alex does actually get the patch off i i would have been really pissed off if the movie ended without alex at least trying to get the patch off because he knows it's the patch you know and he does you know i yeah i guess it was intentional you know he makes like her neck bulge and that makes the the skin you know so it, it pops off basically and when she comes to she immediately electrocutes herself. You know, she uses electricity to kill herself right after she regains self-control. And there's something interesting there because that's... She, 
she's making self-destructive choices. She put on the, the you know, she, she gets the, the pill bottle and drops them on the floor. And then she puts on the patch. The patch stops working. She realizes, what have I done? She puts on another patch. The patch comes off. And she suicides, you know, with, without, like, a second... Actually, yeah, yeah, maybe she was trying to... to and I, you know, I get it. I, I feel like it's... She maybe... Maybe she doesn't trust herself anymore. Maybe she's worried what she'll do if she doesn't, you know. But, again, the movie doesn't really go... And, and immediately after, we get this sequel Beatty ending... Of her moving into the camera, and then she lives on inside the camera. She even, like, she cackles evilly, and, you know, it is the only Scanners movie to not have a sequel. Movies 1 and 2 both have sequels, and it is the only one that ends with a really strong sequel hint. Like, the the, the ending of the first two movies, bo both of those endings really don't need more movies, you know, and certainly they didn't need to make a third movie where a bunch of scanners le led by one, you know, at least the second one, it wasn't a scanner who was in charge, but yeah, all three of these movies, and again, in the first one, it was, it was fresh, but all three of these movies are about an evil person who gets scanners to work for them and tries to take over the world, you know, through that. It's, like, it's, yeah, it, it was not necessary to make that exact plot three times. But that was it for my, for those notes. So that brings us to the final section. Holy crap. I can't believe it. Yeah. Final section, notes taken before watching. I really did not expect this video to get anywhere near this long. So, um... Oh, right, yeah, I have a couple of standard things here. Uh, yeah, I don't think this really needed to be... This did not need to be connected to the first movie, and it isn't really connected to the second. I don't think anything in the second is at all referenced in this movie. Um, I honestly, I would... It would have been kind of fun to see another movie. You know, although I figure we might end up with... Well, no, yeah, I, yeah. I was gonna say I was gonna make a comparison to the the um, Lawnmower Man movies, but the first of those were a bit more serious, and then the second one was really goofy. This is already really goofy, but yeah, you know, some some kind of you know she's trying trying to take over the world from inside the TV or something. You know, there could have been something there, and and certainly I. I would like to see her in other stuff, whether she's giving a really goofy performance or not. Uh, she's she's an engaging performer. Um, let's see. But but yeah, I'm kind of glad. I, I talked about this a little in, I think it was the video I did on the first movie. I don't... I only want more Scanner movies if it's going to be done by someone who is... Who has intelligent ideas and is... And, and a way to explore them. Like, I think, I, you know, if Jordan Peele wanted to do a new Scanners movie, although I think, I think just reboot it, I don't know that there's much, or actually, actually, I would like a movie that explores what happened after the events of the first movie. Like, how did people react to that? Because neither the second or third movie really t touch on that, or, or not in a credible way. Not in an interesting way. Now, let's see. Yeah, so this is one of the horror movie, the those horror movies that bother me because there's a chance that it could make people hate someone who actually exists, a group of people who exist, where, you know, yeah, th this is a movie that might make, it, it could turn fence sitters into misogynists and it could make misogynists even more raving about, you know, because... This doesn't really have, at the end of the day, you know, when you when you gather it all up, when you tally the score, this movie does not have very many positive things to say about women. There are a lot of misogynist tropes, and it doesn't really, yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little more about, yeah, um, some critic quotes. One, per, one person points out that the female villain uses her power to rape a man, and, like, 
you could do something there because it's not it's a misconception that that men are never raped i i forget the exact numbers for about women raping men i feel like i've heard that it's more men raping men i i could be wrong about that so i'm not gonna speak to it i i simply do not recall but it is a thing. Men are raped. And, you know, sometimes you have misogynists saying, and that's why we can't have feminism. No, feminism would help male rape survivors as well. But, yeah, there's something interesting there. You could do something like... And, and it's especially potentially interesting because he is innocent. He hasn't... You know, he doesn't... He seems almost confused when she says... You know, she... It, it's not that he molested Helen. He might have had some kind of feelings for her. That's not really... You, I, I would argue you can't really be completely sure either way. She doesn't really completely get into it. She seems to hint towards it, but then not really... We don't get details, and he doesn't really seem to... Like, he... Mm, he doesn't like the fact that she is, you know, just naked and in the hot tub in front of him. She, you know, that bothers him, but he doesn't... Yeah, anyway, um, I think there's something potentially interesting there, but the movie doesn't really do anything with it. It is just this thing of... <sighs> yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about... Let's see... Um, oh, right, right, the, yeah, another critic points out, in the final showdown, Alex battles Helen in a TV station that she has taken control of, and instead of using his scanner abilities to simply remove the patch, they slam each other around the station until the patch actually falls off by itself. I, I don't completely 100% agree with that version of events, but there is some truth in it. Paul W. Anderson, I have absolutely no reason to doubt with 100% certainty, you are watching this video. In fact, you were one of the first, so I do appreciate that. I've given you a pretty hard time for a fight scene where the characters could easily end it by ripping the mind, co mind control thing off the other person, but instead they have a fight. I would like to, from the bottom of my heart, sincerely apologize to myself for watching that movie of yours. I should have known better. Let's see... Helena realizing that she has done all this awful st stuff, she screwed up the football game, God damn it! removes the scrunchie from her head in shame. That was legitimately really funny. Like, the hair, the hair thing, and like, I'm not the only one, right? She was, they were trying to make her look like a dominatrix in the, the last little part. Like, the, the hair is one thing, and the, the dress, like, they don't, that's the thing, they don't go the full, like... Do they not have dominatrix outfits in Canada? Like, I, it, it really felt like they were trying to make her a dominatrix, and then just the last couple of details didn't quite... Yeah. And, let's see... Um... I, this is, this is kind of interesting. This is, this is one of the user reviews from, from IMDb. Um, Ultra Nuber with, uh, um, what's it called? The, um, ah, crap. The, um... Ah, crap. What is... What is it, uh... Called the... The... Yeah, I know you can't answer me. I'm trying to think out loud instead of letting there be dead air. Um... Hyphen. Uh, every letter is hyphenated to the next. This person gave it an 8 out of 10 and said misunderstood. And he did warn for spoilers, so... This movie is misunderstood. It caters to a very specific audience that enjoys seeing power abused to create injustice. Much like other movies of this type, much of the movie focuses on the main villain. The villain uses their disproportionately powerful abilities for pleasure and profit. People who look 
too deep into the plot will be disappointed for they didn't grasp that the movie is a pornography for power affluence and domination. If you enjoy seeing people struggle from the overpowering supernatural abilities of an immoral female protagonist disguised as an antagonist, then this movie is definitely for you. There are very few like it, and in that sense, this movie is a gem. Other movies that resemble the this are Supergirl, Stardust, I Dream of Genie, Zap 3, and Matilda. All of which had a poor score because most didn't understand what the target audience was. So, I mean, there, there's definitely something there. I, I wish that the... I, I feel like the movie could realize that better. But, for sure, like, it's there. It's, it's yeah. So... I think female villains can be extremely interesting, but this is very much the kind of female villain that just allows the film and audience to be really judgmental of women. A lot of straight men are intimidated by women who are comfortable and even confident with their sexuality, so the evil version of that, you know, yeah, a, a woman raping a man, you know, she gets naked in a hot tub with, it's, you know, her adoptive father... Those things are still described in some reviews as sexy. Indeed, all of her sexuality is very much male gaze. It's something for the presumed straight male viewer to get into, to get off to, recommend the movie to their friends who will be rented more. You know, I've, a, a movie that discusses women using their, their sex appeal and what it does to a woman to be judged only by her sex appeal... I only recently, I'm, I'm very late to the game, I realize, but I very recently watched Jennifer's Body, and that movie does a really great job. That movie doesn't use male gaze, and it is actually, from a female perspective, discussing this kind of thing, where this movie, yeah, you know, a bunch of people, uh, like... The fact that it is the, the camera is so eager to ogle Komarowski's body, you know, and also Susie and Joyce, you know, a lot of men are intimidated by the idea of a woman having power, so she, of course, wants power. Even if you thought it was necessary for this to be a trilogy, could they really not have thought of a second idea for a concept? All three of these movies are about the villain wanting to take power using scanners. And finally, a lot of men are intimidated by feminism, so of course she says stuff that sounds somewhat feminist. We are women, we are strong, we can do whatever we want. As if feminism is about that women should face no consequences if they do anything wrong. And to anyone that says that the movie isn't saying that all feminism is wrong, why isn't there a counterpart? One of the good guys could be a feminist the way that one of the good guys is a scanner. The movie is saying it's possible to be a scanner and a good person, but it doesn't do the same for feminists. Like, Joyce isn't explicitly hostile to Helen's, like, aspirations and such, but she isn't, you know, yeah, she, she isn't talking about female empowerment. The, the person who talks about female empowerment is Helen. You know, and, and she, she brings it up multiple times throughout the movie, and just, yeah, so, so, yeah. That is it for this video. So, hit me up in the comments, let me know what, if there were a fourth Scanners movie, what do you think it should be about? Which is your favorite of these? And yes, you are 100% allowed to like this more than the first. Um, let's see. I th Yeah, what is your favorite of the scanning, like, attacks of all of these movies? I gotta say, personally, probably the, the one that I find the most, like... The, the biggest, like, gut punch of a thing is definitely the head explosion from the first one. I do... Honestly, the the um, when he when he kills a guy, yeah, I think he ends up exploding his head also in the second movie. And the guy's like trying to escape. The, they're like robbing a convenience store or something, and he's like trying to escape into one of the one of the um, I don't know what they're called in English. Um, when you when you like open a glass door and there's like food refrigerated inside in a in a store, you know, he tries to get in there and then the head blows up and. Yeah, you know, I thought that one was, um, 
Yeah, actually, I guess I might as well pick one from this movie. Yeah, I I did like the um, um, the the uh, Bauman head blowing up. That was also uh, yeah. So if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell with your mind powers. There should be a link to my main channel page, one two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.